Happy October, folks. Welcome back to Hashtag Ask GSM for October 3rd, 2016. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. As always, answering your awesome questions from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube right here on the show. If you want to send in a question, be sure to do so at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post. I usually put up on Sunday nights or on the wall itself. You can tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM or drop a comment on this very video. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. So without further ado, no time to waste. We'll kick off with your questions here today, starting with my brother Jason Blue Eye Disorder from YouTube. Your thoughts on the crowd during the TJ Perkins versus Kendrick match on Raw. I think he was talking about TJ Perkins versus uh, Tony Nese. But nevertheless... I thought they were trying to hijack the show and showed no interest in the match. Not sure if it was the position of the match on the card or but or, or what, but they were yelling CM Punk and Randy Savage. That was stupid. That was stupid. I mean, I thought the match was good. Um, I think it did have more to do... It, it was a few different things. One, it took place in the third hour because they weren't chanting that. And the, the, the second issue is that the characters aren't really defined yet. I mean, we know TJ Perkins was homeless. He won the Cruiserweight Championship. He won the CWC. But what else do we really know about him? What, what else do casual fans know about him? You know, we, we got to know these wrestlers through the CWC. and uh, But the casual viewers, other than like a 30-second video package, we really don't know much about any of these guys. Tony Nese specifically, too. Uh, just because that guy really kind of came out of nowhere. He had a great showing in the CWC in the first few rounds. But he didn't... You know, we we probably saw one 30-second, not even, not even 30 seconds, like a 15-second video package before he came out for his match, if that, last week. So fans didn't really have an incentive to cheer for one guy over the other. Um, but that then again, the same thing could be said for the other cru- Cruiserweight match in the show. Cedric Alexander and Rich Swan versus, I think, Lince Dorado and who was the other guy? Um, not Graham Italic. Was it Graham Italic? I don't think so. It was Oh, Drew Gallick. Drew Gallock, or however you pronounce it. Um, so, and, and they weren't chanting during that match, it was just during the Perkins and Tony Nese match, and that match suffered from the same issue, in that we don't really know much about the competitors, specifically Drew Gallick and, uh, and Lince Dorado, but I think with the second match with Perkins versus Tony Nese, it was more a matter of the fact that, uh, you know, it, it took place in the third hour, around 10.30, these guys should be kicking off the show. I don't know why they're waiting until 9.30, 10.30, maybe to help the show not drag. I mean, I think the presentation of the division so far is great. Um, that's probably why people are chanting, but I still thought it was stupid. It's like, you people want a rat. Like, I could see you chanting that during an awful Hornswoggle segment, okay? But I, I I don't understand why you would chant CM Punk versus Rand- and, and Randy Savage during a, a Perkins and Tony Nese match. The match was really good. It's not like we're getting the same old shit with Big Show versus Mark Henry or Kane versus God knows who. <clears throat> it's something fresh. It's something new. And people still don't appreciate it for whatever reason. It wasn't everybody. It was a pocket full of fans. But that annoyed me. His second question. What was the point of Jericho going over at the pay-per-view? Sami Zayn should have been put over to elevate his status, right? Reminded me of when Bray Wyatt lost to Chris Jericho for really no reason. Um, I did not have a problem personally with Zayn losing the match of Clash of Champions to Jericho. Just because I thought, keyword thought, that the feud would go on past Clash of Champions, and they would probably wrap it up at Hell in the Cell. I don't know when Jericho's leaving. I think it's at the end of the year. But I figured they would give Jericho the win, the initial win at Clash of Champions, and then it built to Zayn finally winning the blow-off match at Hell in the Cell, which makes the most sense, because Jericho can win. He's a six-time world champion, and Sami Zayn benefits from losing anyway, so I thought it worked out perfectly. That being said, um, it looks like the feud was scrapped. Um, and I'm not going to say for no reason, because it looks like the plan the entire t- it looked like the, the the plan the entire time was to have Jericho pick up an easy win and then get inserted into the WWE Universal Championship picture, which is fine. I'm fine by that. I think that's great. But it does nothing for Sami Zayn. So that that's really the only reason, from what it appears, why Jericho beat Zayn in the pay per view. In the Bray and Jericho thing, I see what you mean, Jason. It's a little different just because they built to. Again, that was a little different just because they built to Bray beating Jericho at SummerSlam and again in the Steel Cage match on Raw a few weeks after that. So that did, I mean, I, that was also a bit questionable. Also coming off of the losses Bray Wyatt had and Money in the Bank and to John Cena several times that year. So his loss to Jericho didn't help matters, specifically because it was clean too. That was a bit weird. But at least that built to something. For right now, it's only been one Raw. If you're listening to this after Raw this week, maybe it's changed. Maybe they rekindled the rivalry. I have no idea. But so far, from what it appears to me, they scrapped the feud. So really, 
I could see why it helps Jericho, but it did nothing for Sami Zayn whatsoever, and the guy remains directionless, which is criminal to me. Elena the Y, their question was, I think the team of Sheamus and Cesaro could be very beneficial to those guys in the division itself. What I don't support is WWE using their tedious can they coexist narrative instead of the seven plus matches we've seen between them already. Battle can hard or battle can harden and bond people, even if they were once enemies. That story literally every fantasy novel film show is understood. Why not just skip straight to the Cesaro Sheamus being the new Road Warriors who wreck the new day because we know the club cannot, which is a great point. Um, yeah, for Cesaro Sheamus, you make a great point about the whole can they coexist thing. You know, like you said, I mean, you make a great point that um. I mean, I guess it would make no sense if they coexisted from the get-go, if they were just like best friends and they joined the tag team division just because they've been feuding for so many months now. That said, you don't need to spend fucking two months on this shit where they're on the that we're on they're on separate pages. Like Rhino and Heath Slater were kind of not really rivals, but uh, a makeshift tag team that kind of put their differences aside from the get-go and they worked well as a team. Why cannot we? Why can't we see the same thing with? Slater or not with uh, Cesaro and Sheamus. You make a great point, and it is kind of annoying because they spend way too much time in the hole. Can they remain on the same page? And more often than not, they do. And I would hope they do, just because we've already seen seven matches between them, and I really could not care less if this is building to another match at Hell in a Cell or whatever. So hopefully, you make a great point. I wasn't really thinking about that, but we see the same thing over in wrestling over and over again. So hopefully, they skip right over that and they get to right when they can coexist become a, an amazing tag team. It's different when you have a team Hell No who are actually entertaining than a team of Cesaro and Sheamus who aren't really entertaining as a tag team, but they can have great matches as a tag team. So let's hope they skipped straight to that narrative sooner rather than later. Emmanuel A. is WWE rushing the Brian Kendrick story. His WC, or WCW, his CWC arc was that his turning was his last shot but he's already getting a rematch of the Cruiserweight Championship when all he did was head to, was headbutt TJP after losing his first shot at Clash of Champions. Yeah, they are kind of rushing it. I mean, like you said, I mean, he came on Raw. First night back on Raw, wins the number one contenders match. Goes to the belt that Sunday at the pay-per-view. Loses, quote-unquote, turns heel, whatever. And then gets a rematch tonight on Raw. And I imagine he's probably going to win. So, uh, I mean, you'll know better than I would if you're listening to this after Raw, before Raw, or a little bit during Raw, whatever. I assume he will win, though. Um, but they are kind of, they are kind of rushing, but I don't really blame them just because they wanted to have TJ Perkins face an established guy from the get-go that people, that some fans are already familiar with in the Brian Kendrick. If they put him up against Graham Metallic again, or they put him up against Alex, if they put him up against Alexander or Rich Swan or even Drew Gallick or whoever, it, people wouldn't have known how to react just because they don't really know those guys. Kendrick is still a little bit of an unknown. He has been in the company since 2009, but he's more of a notable name than anyone else in the division right now. So I could see why they put him in that position. And uh, But I, I do agree it is coming at the expense of his great character arc in the CWC. His second question, do you think the primary reason New Day has cooled off for a couple of people is that they haven't gotten the fin of the feud yet? They could have had something with the Wyatts feud, but they simply brushed off their loss of Battleground like nothing happened. We still haven't gotten that one rival that actively pushes them as characters. And again, you make a great point. You were absolutely right. They have really not evolved. I mean, they're really entertaining, and I still find them entertaining, but they haven't really developed their characters all that much in the past year plus. I mean, they've had some good feuds, some really good matches, but yeah, they really haven't evolved other than going from face to heel, or heel to face, rather. Um, and like you said, though, the whole Wyatt family feud, at first it was like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to help the Wyatts at all. And in the end, it really didn't. I'll explain why in a second. But the character, like the promos, the character development in that feud from both the Wyatts and specifically the New Day was great. It really got all those people on the same page, adapting a more serious tone, a more aggressive edge to their characters. And it led to nothing for New Day. They, they lost, or the Wyatts won. And they didn't go for the belts. They just got broken up literally like the, the week before at during the WWE draft. So really, what was the point? But they won, though. Um, so what if, for, for whatever that's worth. But yeah, I mean, the New Day, for a lot of people, have cooled off. Not for a lot, but I mean, for a decent portion of people. You know, I got a question last week why they were stale, why they're stagnant, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't say they're stale just yet. I still find them entertaining. That's just me personally. But I do, I do see what you mean in that they really have not gotten their one 
definitive feud yet that really pushes them as characters. And yeah, like you said, they had that with the Wyatts and they kind of blew it off for whatever reason. Mitch G from YouTube as well got a couple questions here. Keep or erase the Brotherhood versus the Shield versus the Usos from Hell in a Cell 2013 or the Fatal 4-Way Tag Team Championship match from TLC 2013? Definitely the first one. That TLC Fatal 4-Way Tag wasn't bad, but it had fucking like Big Show and... Rey Mysterio in there for whatever reason. I have no idea why. That was so fucking random. I think they got their title shot like the next night on Raw. And it led to... They lost. And it led to nothing. They were right back to where they started. Uh, I mean, they lost and then, then they broke up right afterwards. So that was really a waste. They had a right Axel in there who I never really cared for. The real Americans, whatever. But anyway, um, yeah, the triple threat from Hell in a Cell, though, that same year was also really, really, really good. The TLC match wasn't bad, but that match from Hell in a Cell was awesome and really one of the saving graces of that show. So I got to keep the Brotherhood versus the Shield versus the Usos from Hell in a Cell and erase the Fatal 4-Way Tag Team title match or the... Um, oh, no, I thought that was the number one contenders match. You're right. It was a championship match, and Big Show and Rey Mysterio almost won, but they lost in the end. So, yeah, I would go with definitely the, the, the former over the latter. His second question, what were your thoughts on Goldust's unexplained supposed face turn before Stardust attacked him the week before Fastlane? Correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't they still both heels at that point? Why were WWE randomly presenting him as a good guy? So I guess the whole, I do remember that. It's because they were teasing for about a month or so. They were teasing tension between Goldust and Stardust. Because Goldust, you know what? It was so fucking confusing. That whole feud was botched beyond belief. But what they did was that they had both guys tease that they were going to turn on the other. Like, I remember one week they had Goldust walk off on Stardust. And I'm thinking, okay, they're going to have Goldust turn heel, which should have been the case the entire time. And Cody should have gone back to being Cody Rhodes, being a babyface, but whatever. And then the week after that, it was Stardust walking off on Goldust. So you didn't really know what to think. So after a couple weeks, it became apparent that they were turning Goldust over Stardust. And they would have the two split. And instead of fleshing out the feud until WrestleMania, they sped it up a little bit. They had Goldust go babyface, seemingly, by having Stardust turn on him on the, on the Raw before the pay-per-view. And then they had a match that Sunday. Instead of saving their first initial encounter for WrestleMania, they blew it off that Sunday at the pay-per-view. And as a result, no one fucking cared. The match really was not that good. And then I, re I remember liking it at the time, but if you watch it back, it's like that wasn't really a good match. The crowd did not, could not have cared less because the feud just started. They just turned Goldust six days earlier on Raw. So why should anyone care about this guy and him going up against his brother? It was really a wasted opportunity because they blew off the feud. That Goldust won on like a botch it looked like. And they scrapped the feud like a week later. So that, that's the whole story with that feud. Like I said, botched beyond belief. Um, just the whole thing was really just ruined, and they ruined a perfect opportunity to have a great brother versus brother match at WrestleMania 31. His next question: What are your thoughts on, or what? Yeah, what are your thoughts on the way Madison Reigns' championship reign ended at Lockdown 2011? I personally think it was stupid for Mickey James to win when she was hurt in real life. Why wouldn't they keep the belt on Madison and make it even more, make it mean even more for James to win when she could actually be healthy at a later date? Which he would actually be healthy at a later date. I do not remember James being... You're probably right. I just don't remember that. I do remember the match being, like, super quick, though. I think, right? What, didn't they have a match that was, like, a minute long or something? Because I remember James's hair was on the line. And she won really, really quickly. Like, in the same fashion that she beat Michelle McCool for the women's title back at Royal Rumble 2010. Like, a year earlier. Um, so it was really weird the way that unfolded. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was a bit weird. Madison Rain was really the MVP of the Knockouts division in, like, 2010-2011. In the absence of, like, Angelina Love and Velvet Sky and kind of breaking out of their shadows from the beautiful people, she really kind of emerged on her own as a great single star. And uh, they really cut the reign short. I mean, you knew Mickie James was going to win at some point. But if what you're saying is true and Mickie James was hurt, then why would you put the belt on her at that point? Just... You know, like you said, make it mean more for Mickey James to win it a month or two later when she's healthy. You know, that didn't really make much sense. But, um, yeah, I thought Madison Rain, bottom line, that was great in her role as the Queen Bee of the Knockouts division for two or three years at that point. Keep or erase Styles and Angle versus Bad Influence from Slammiversary 2012 or Kurt Angle and Jeff Hardy versus No Surrender or from No Surrender 2010. 
God, this is no question. Styles and Angle versus Bad Influence from Slammiversary 2012. I don't even remember Kurt Angle versus Jeff Hardy from No Surrender. Maybe because I think I saw that show. I mean, they had a good match. They, these two always have good matches. But that Slammiversary match, dude, was off the fucking chain. That was such a great match. Such a great match. Uh, one of my favorite matches... Oh, man. It probably is my favorite AJ Styles TNA match. Or at least one of them. Um, I know I did a whole list earlier this year, right when he arrived in WWE, of my favorite AJ Styles matches. I mean, obviously the list would change now that he's, all the, that he's had all these great matches in WWE. But um, uh, one of the top TNA matches on that list was that match, the Slammiversary match with him and Angle versus Bad Influence. Just... At the time, I fucking loved it. It's on his DVD that I have. I watched it earlier this year. I watched it when I watched Slammiversary a couple months ago. Um, it's such a, just a really, really, really good match. And, um, yeah, so that definitely got to keep that one and erase the other one. Erase Kurt Angle versus Jeff Hardy from No Surrender 2010. The first KFC also from YouTube. Should WWE get rid of pay-per-views like Money in the Bank, Hell in the Cell, TLC, etc.? Yes, they should. Um, I've said this for years now, but... Huh, the, the whole reason why they innovated these pay-per-views, these events, was be, to boost buy rates. And that's not really necessary anymore because they have the WWE Network and they don't really look at buy rates. They look at network subscriptions. And that was really a bust anyway because the numbers for these shows, you know, uh, compared to No Mercy and the Unforgivens of the World, really, or Armageddon even, which they replaced, you know, TLC with, uh, or replaced Armageddon with was TLC. It did not boost buy rates at all. Buy rates were already declining in, in the last number of years, a lot like the ratings are currently. Buy rates were being flushed down the toilet. So at that point, it really was not worth it um, to change the... Because uh, the, the, the change in pay-per-views did not make a lick of a difference. People did not buy the shows because we have an abundance of Hell in a Cell and TLC matches. In 2009, they had fucking three Hell in a Cell matches on the same show. Three! Three Hell in a Cell matches, which was ridiculous. And nowadays, they have about two, one to two, which is still too many. And I've always said it should not be like, oh, it's October, time to do Hell in a Cell again. They should only bring it back when it means something. Same thing with TLC. The TLC show, as entertaining as it can be from year to year, it, it really is the demolition derby of the WWE, but not in a good way. When you already have extreme rules, TLC is not necessary. And then, what was the other one you named? Money in the Bank, at this point, eh, I would just bring it back to WrestleMania. I mean, now with the brand split, I mean, I guess you could do two ladder matches if you want. To do, you know, um, you could do one Raw one and one SmackDown one. I mean, that's the only one I might keep, just because Money in the Bank has always been a really, really good show. Um, it's kind of like their fourth... Definitely the biggest B pay-per-view they've ever done. They, they do all year, just because they always stack the card. It's almost always entertaining. So I could kind of see them keeping that around, but even that, I would put that back at WrestleMania. But yeah, they definitely should get rid of pay-per-views like that just because they're so pointless in 2016, especially now that Raw gets Hell in a Cell, but SmackDown gets TLC. I mean, I guess it kind of evens it out, but what if a SmackDown guy, what if two SmackDown superstars... Have a rivalry that is befitting within Hell in a Cell that, that that deserves that justifies the Hell in a Cell. What do you do then? You know what I mean. So I think just stupid. Here's the next question: Push repackage and release Shining Stars, Golden Truth, and the Hype Bros. Push the hype. I like the Hype Bros. So I'd push the Hype Bros. They're not amazing, but they're a lot better than the Shining Stars and the Golden Truth. Let's say that much. So I'd push them. Repackage the Shining Stars. I know their gimmick sucks, but they were pretty decent as Primo and Epico before the whole Los Matadores thing. So I've repackaged them and released Golden Truth. I don't care how you repackage them, but just I don't fucking care about these guys. They're both past their prime. I like Goldust, could not care less about R-Truth. They dropped the ball with him once he turned babyface five, six years ago, four or five years ago. And then Goldust, it's just, there really isn't much more for him to do at this point. So I just released them, repackaged Shining Stars, and pushed the Hype Bros. Chris M. from Facebook do you think the WWE should unify the U.S. and IC titles? If you asked me that about a year ago, I probably would have said yes, because I know, and I don't know if that was the plan or not, because it looked like when they had John Cena win the U.S. title at WrestleMania 31, and they had Daniel Bryan win the IC title on that same show, a lot of people were saying they should do the 
You know, Cena Bryan 2 at the same pay-per-view that where they faced off two years earlier at SummerSlam 2015 to unify those two belts. Now, of course, that was pre-brand split. They have the brand split now. They they not only did they didn't even take away old titles, they added new ones, which was for the better. I've always said less is more, but they need their separate set of championships for each show. So I get that. So at this point, they should not unify the belts. Keep each belt on each show for as you know for the mid card division. That makes the most sense to me. Uh, maybe at some point a year ago, but it's probably for the better they didn't unify them, just because you know with the brand split now you kind of need both belts on, on each show. Brandon A from YouTube, what would be your thoughts on a Naomi versus Charlotte feud down the line when they are on the same brand? Of course, based around who is the better athlete, Charlotte can play up the genetically superior gimmick. And announcers putting over how athletic Naomi is in all of her matches. Do you think this could work? Um, yeah, that could be a good feud. Um, Naomi has improved a lot in the ring. She's still sometimes a little reckless. She's sometimes a little green. But she's still far and beyond 10 times better than she was four or five years ago. Um, so, yeah, I think the feud could be good. It's something new. It's something fresh. I don't even know if we've seen that match before. I feel like we probably have when they were doing the whole fucking... You know, uh, the Divas Revolution, whatever the hell they were calling it about a year ago. I'm sure they did it back then, at least one time. But other than that, we, we've never seen them feud. And Charlotte has feuded with pretty much everybody, from Becky to Sasha to Natalia to Paige. She's feuded with a lot of people, you know, between both brands. So I would be completely fine with them, you know, moving forward from that and then doing a uh, Naomi and Charlotte feud at some point. Like you said, they're not on the same brand now, but maybe next year when one gets drafted to the other brand or whatever. Um, his next question here, do you think the Royal Rumble should be 40 men now that it will be in a stadium? I've been saying this for years. Every single time it looks like they're bringing back the 40-man Rumble, they don't. And I like the 40-man Rumble at the time. It was not a good idea. It was not, because it drags on. It's like adding... It's like a three-hour Raw, I think would be the perfect comparison. They're fun every once in a while. They were good, you know, for that first time. But if you do it every single week, it just loses it lost, It loses its luster immediately. And not only that, but they drag. It's boring. It's filled with a lot of filler, completely full of filler. So <laughs> I think it's a perfect comparison just because I would not want to see a 40-man rumble every year. I mean, I know I was pitching it a few years ago in like 2013, 2014, whatever. But at this point in time, with the roster they have, I mean, I guess now now that they have two brands, it might be a little bit more likely, but the ro the roster depth is still shit. And back when they did it in 2011, they brought back Booker T and Diesel. They had the Nexus. They had the core. They don't have groups like that nowadays, really. So I don't really see any need to do it. So I wouldn't bring back the 40-man rumble. And, you know, and maybe at some point down the line, I mean, I wouldn't complain about it, but... A lot of people did not like the 2011 Rumble, and it's hard to blame them. I liked it just because of the stories told. 2011 is one of my, excuse me, one of my favorite years and and, and my years as a wrestling fan. It wasn't an amazing year. It was just one of my favorite. There's a distinct difference there, but it was filled with a lot of job guys, a lot of core guys, a lot of Nexus guys, a lot of Jimmy Usos and Chris Masters of the world, and you know people like that. So I would not do it again, even though. It will be in a stadium. I don't think that really makes much of a difference. They should make the Rumble mean something again. You know, I thought this year's installment was really good. Hopefully they don't fuck it up this year. But, um, so, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't, just because it is in a stadium, which is great, it should not, it, it does not have to be 40 men. His next question, since you can't push everybody at the same time, why do, inter why do internet fans still complain when certain fan favorites don't get pushed? Especially considering the fact that about 75 to 80 percent of both rosters consist of fan favorites now, because internet people like to complain. I complain from time to time too. I do it on Wrestle Rant Radio. Then again, that's the whole point. That's I rant about sh shit. But more often than not, though, I try not to complain. I try to appreciate the shit. And, uh, you know, appreciate the good stuff and take the good, uh, you know, over the bad and whatever else, and kind of focus on the positives, not really the negatives. But um, yeah, I mean. It, it, it depends. I mean, I'll complain about a Sami Zayn not getting pushed. This is where it's a little bit different. Because you have guys like Shining Stars on Raw every single week, but not Sami Zayn. Okay, like a Neville I can understand. Sami Zayn, however... Like, why is Sheamus on Raw over Sami Zayn? Like, answer me that. That, to me, makes no sense. Because Sami Zayn was involved in one of the best feuds, if not the best feud of the year with Kevin Owens... And then they just scrap it, and then they move, or they, they culminated the feud, which was fine. 
but then they go on to do next to nothing with Sami Zayn. So again, it's um, I can see the complaints. It, they don't have to be pushed per se, but they should be on the show. Or at least be receiving of some sort of direction. Like Apollo Crews, same thing. I understand he's not going to be WWE champion anytime soon. But the least they could do is get this guy on TV and in a meaningful role. Where he's at least winning. Kane wins more matches than Apollo Crews. Which should not be happening in 2016. So again, I can understand where you're coming from with some people. Like, uh, why isn't fucking, I don't know, why isn't, I mean, we have a lot of fan favorites, we have a lot of internet favorites as champion right now, so I can't really say, why isn't, you know, fucking uh, Dolph Ziggler the IC champion, right, I don't see a lot of people saying that, but you know what I mean, it's because they have a hotter star right now in in, in the Miz, or why is Roman Reigns the US champion, why is that not Sami Zayn, I guess it would be a perfect example, because they're going in a different direction, but they could still do something with Sami Zayn, it does not have to be United States champion, but they could be doing something with him where he's on the show and he's not on fucking superstars every week. And there's a last question here. I remember you said last week you wouldn't consider any you wouldn't consider any Triple H match a dream match now. I also have a hard time placing Jericho in a dream match scenario. Do you think both of these wrestlers are now being underappreciated because of their longevity, consistency, and durability? Um the difference is, I would, I mean, I think Jericho is just underappreciated in general, but maybe not more so this year, just because he really has rejuvenated his character, and he's one of the best parts about Raw, and it's going to be a sad day when he eventually leaves. So, I think, I don't even know if I'd call Triple H underrated. He's not underrated. He isn't, Triple H is not underrated, but I don't think he's, I don't think neither one of these guys, I don't think any one of these guys are underappreciated because of their longevity, consistency, and durability. They've been around for almost 20 years, 25 years in the case of Triple H. So I don't think they're underappreciated. Um, but I, my thought still stands. I would not put Triple H in a dream. There really is no match in 2016 that's like, wow, that's a dream match. Other than the match with Seth Rollins, maybe Kevin Owens. That to me makes the most sense from a storyline standpoint. But even that, I'm not waiting for... The match should be good. But I don't want to watch it because it's going to be a five-star classic. You know, I want to see it because the story is built up to that point. With Jericho, I mean, maybe it's just me, but there are a couple dream matches, I guess, left with him. You know, the matches with AJ Styles, that was a dream match, in my opinion. That was a match I never thought I would see. And all of those matches were really, really good. You could do, uh, you know, Jericho Nakamura, Jericho Balor, two matches they did in Japan back-to-back -back years that have never been aired on TV. Those, to me, are dream matches. Jericho and Balor, Jericho and Nakamura, Jericho and Tommy, maybe. Jericho, we've seen Jericho Owens, but it's not really a dream match, I guess, if we've seen it before. Uh, they did it at the MSG special, actually, one year ago today, which was a great show, by the way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would still say there's some Jericho dream matches left. Not a lot, but there are some. Um, so again, I don't know if I would call them underappreciated, because I feel like people know how great both guys are. For their longevity, consistency, and durability, as you said. So I wouldn't really call them underappreciated or even underrated. But um, uh, to go back to your original question, there are some dream matches I would say left with Jericho, or at least for me anyway. Sean Marcus Stick from Twitter. His question was, who would you have beat Nakamura for the title? Um, Probably Bobby Roode. It does not look like they're going to do Bobby Roode and Nakamura in Toronto. So I guess you could just do it then, right? I mean, not not, not then, but I mean after that. I mean, I, I assume they're going to do Joe Nakamura. I thought they would do it on TV. At this point, probably not because it's already October. And Nakamura is still off TV for right now, selling an injury at the hands of Samoa Joe. Uh, but either Bobby Roode or Tommy. Um, oh, hopefully over WrestleMania weekend. And call up Nakamura, then at the WrestleMania. But I haven't dropped the belt either. Bobby Roode, who should also be in the main roster right now. But that's neither here nor there. So either Bobby Roode or Hideo Tommy or... Um, Aries maybe, but we've already seen kind of we've already kind of seen Aries Nakamura, but Aries would be a fine choice. So there's a couple different options, but uh, either Bobby Roode or, or uh, a Tommy, in my opinion. His next question: Push repackage really is Jinder Mahal, Sin Cara, and Mojo Raleigh. A lot of people, I'll be burned to this, I'll be burned at the stake for this, but uh, push Mojo Raleigh. I think he has more potential than Sin Cara and Jinder Mahal do at this point. I know he sucks in the ring, but. I don't know. I, I, I don't hate Mojo. I like Mojo, but I think he's got more more of an upside than Sin Cara or Jinder Mahal, at least now anyway. Repackage Sin Cara uh, into Hunico. Drop the whole Sin Cara shit because it's awful. And then just release Jinder because I don't know why they brought him back other than the job. He really serves no purpose. Other than, I guess they did bring him in the job, but 
there's 20 other jobbers I'd bring back before him because I could not care less about Jinder Mahal. Um, his next question here, why did the New Day club feud last so long that the club were never going to win the titles? Because they needed a placeholder program for the, for the New Day before they were going to break the record in a few months, if that's the direction they're going in, which it has to be. If they beat the club fucking three or four times for the titles, then they have they better be breaking the record. Otherwise, If they drop the belts to Cesaro and Sheamus at Hell in the Cell, then what was the point of them having, if they're not going to break the record, excuse me, if they're not going to break the record, um, the demolition record at the beginning of December, I think the middle of December, whatever it is, then why would you bother having them lose to or beat the club as many times as they did? Because if there's any team on that brand that should be champions right now, it's the club, other than Enzo and Cass. But I don't think they're doing that anytime soon, oddly enough. You know, New Day and Enzo and Cass. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, if they're not going to drop the belts to the club, they might as well break the record at this point. So I'm hoping they do. Because they really missed a golden opportunity to put the belts on those guys who deserve it. But, oh well. Uh, next question. At JohnWell23, who will win this year's Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic? Good question. We have a lot of great teams. Uh, I don't think Cody Ibushi and Hideo Itami are winning, but that's a great fucking tag team. Ibushi and Itami, sign me up. We have Bobby Roode and Ty Dillinger. I don't think they're winning. I think we get some sort of a split or something before then or whatever. They could make it to the final. I mean, I guess it would be pretty cool. You know what, I won't, I won't write them out just yet because we could see the, the Canadian hometown boys winning in Toronto. I could see that. So maybe those guys are not my number one choice, but I could see that happening. Gargano Ciampa, maybe. I think they're heading towards a split before they win the tournament. So I don't think that may be revival. The champions win the whole thing. I feel like the division, the tournament, unlike last year, should be used to elevate a tag team and not just put over, you know, Balor and Joe. I, I understand why they did it to, you know, to further tease the, the split and the tension between those two. But um, it didn't elevate any tag team other than like the Revival and American Alpha, who didn't even win. But they did do very well in these semifinals. Um, so, yeah. So I'd probably have either Bobby Roode and Dillinger win. Uh, Tommy and Ibushi will be great, would be great, but they're not winning because I know Ibushi is not a full-time guy. Um, yeah, I guess maybe the Revival. I guess I'll go with the Revival. I could see the Revival versus Dillinger and, uh, and Roode in Canada. I could totally see that. So I guess we'll see where that goes. Thoughts on Hugo Knox getting released? Did he ever have potential? Um, we saw a little bit of him on NXT as a job guy. He had a good look. And I saw him on Swerved. He was on Breaking Ground. Not a lot. I mean, I saw him a few times. He wasn't really featured all that much. Um, it looked like he had a good look. I heard he was awful in the ranks. That's probably why they let him go if he wasn't making progress. So I don't think it was really like, oh, wow, they, why did they let that guy go? Like, he had so much potential. I don't really know because I really have not seen much of him. He had a good look, but beyond that, I'm sure he was shit in the ranks. That's probably why. Is Rusev getting buried? He's not getting buried. If the guy was getting buried, he wouldn't be on TV or he would have lost the belt months ago. He had a good four-month reign as champion. And he lost to Roman Reigns just because Reigns, you had to know, was going to win the belt at some point anyway. I know he lost at the pay-per-view. I know he had a double count out on Raw. But he's not getting buried, people. Let's let's not get ahead of ourselves here. At Swagzio, will Eli Drake ever become TNA champion, assuming the company stays in business? I hope so. Eli Drake. Dummy. Yeah. Dummy. Yeah. Dummy. Yeah. Hit my dummy button over here. I love Eli Drake. I was so happy he won the uh, Bound for Gold Battle Royal last night of the pay-per-view. Again, assuming the business, uh, assuming the company stays in business. I really hope so. I hope Eli Drake is the one to beat Bobby Lashley for the TNA World title. <laughs> He's so fucking good, dude. The whole company has been doing a lot better from an in-ring standpoint, from a product standpoint, a televised product standpoint all year round. Um, but one of the biggest MVPs of that company, other than Matt Hardy and Bobby Lashley this year, has been Eli Drake. He's so good. So I hope he becomes TNA champion. I don't think so. He's more of a comedy guy, but... He is really, really good, and he does deserve it. He would have a great reign as TNA champion. Thoughts on TJ Perkins getting backstage heat for making comments that he was homeless. So stupid. It seems like you can get heat for saying anything these days. You put peanut butter on your sandwich over jelly. You got heat, brother. You got heat. Why? Why? It just makes no sense. I understand maybe saying wrestling on television. I know it's a naughty word, but... Bringing up your backstory. This is a, a, a legitimate backstory. I could see the whole Sasha getting heat for her promo, which was also stupid as hell. But, oh, you know, it's disrespectful to Daniel Bryan and the Edge and the Tyson Kid. That was a bit teetering the line of stupidness. 
But this is an entirely new level of stupid. They're just dummies. Dummies, yeah, like Eli Drake would say. Um, so, yeah, just so stupid. You can get heat for literally anything these days. It's so fucking dumb. Mr. Singleton, 16. What are some of the things you miss about the WWE since you started watching or even before? Great question. Um, I really couldn't think of anything. When I saw your question, nothing really immediately came to mind. It's like, wow, I really miss that. I mean, there's some things I miss. Like, oh, To Be Loved is the Raw theme song. But, like, Enemies is great. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't bring it back just because it's a new era and that was so 2008. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess the brand split, but we have the brand split back. The women's, like a real women's division? I, I can't even really say I missed that because we never really had a women's division. A real, solid, legitimate women's division before now, before 2016. Really not many things that I miss. I miss CM Punk. I miss CM, I guess CM Punk. I'll say CM Punk. I miss CM Punk, so I'll say that much. Um, the one, two, three egg. Is Damian Sando slash Aaron Rex boring? Yes, he's boring to me. I like Damian Sandow. That's what disappoints me so much about this guy is that he's a good wrestler. He's entertaining. But apparently his gimmick in TNA is that he has no gimmick. Why? That's so stupid. And no one cares. He came out to like a non-reaction last night. Like he got a big pop when he first debuted. He cut a good promo. But even from the get-go, you knew this guy was going to be limited. Like I still had my doubts even when he showed up when he cut the whole not anti-WWE promo. But the typical, stereotypical first promo and TNA promo, that's where they're like, oh, I was held down in the WWE and that other company here, I'm going to thrive and that whole shit. And he's really, he's just Aaron Stevens. He's not really, you know, he, he's not anyone exciting. He doesn't really have a character. As Damien Mizdow, he was great. As the intellectual savior of the masses, he was great. With the Road Scholars, he was great. Whenever he has a gimmick, he's great. When he's himself... He's boring as hell. He's not a bad wrestler. It looks like he's put on a couple pounds, um, however, since leaving WWE. But he, he's just not doing it for me in TNA for whatever reason. The guy's just he's boring as watching grass grow, really. In TNA right now, he's just not exciting. Is the whole thing. I don't know if it was his decision, TNA's decision, but he has no gimmick. Like, if he was the intellectual savior of the masses... That would be great, but I mean, even then, you know, I know a couple years ago they had the whole promo, or a year and a half ago they had the promo where he was like, I just want to connect with you guys as myself, as just Damian Sandow. Maybe that would have been a bust too. Remember they scrapped that for the whole Macho Mandow thing, so maybe just being himself is not a good thing after all. Maybe we, we would have realized that as soon as he did the turn into Damian Sandow and just, and, you know, dropping the whole Mizdow gimmick um, about a year and a half ago, and I was pissed they never really went in that direction, but maybe it was for the better. Last two questions from at Scarlet One, also from Twitter. What is your take on what is your own take on the 2016 version of Commissioner Foley? It's really night and day. I mean, so far I've been disappointed. I like Mick Foley as the GM over like you know Triple H or whoever else. But I don't know. I mean, I guess when I thought I figured when he took power that we would have some sort of you know a lot like Commissioner Foley back in 2000, where he was having more fun with the role and he was more entertaining. We don't really have that because he's having his balls chopped off by Stephanie. It looks like he struggles with his lines. He's all over the show. I mean, again, it's better Mick Foley than anyone else because Mick Foley is a real likable guy. But so far, it's not been a bust per se, but it's not really living up to my expectations because so far he's really just kind of getting manipulated and emasculated, completely emasculated by Stephanie McMahon. And that, that's really all that he's done so far. He really has not done much more of no other than that. And the last question of the day, should TNA Impact continue to live on? <sighs> I love TNA. They should. I don't want to see them go into business, if that's your question. Do they deserve to live on now? This company has had so many opportunities. They have been given so many chances when so many other companies have not. And other companies have folded. The fact that this, this company has outlived ECW and WCW blows my mind. But they have, um, surprisingly so. Um, but for the amount of opportunities that they have been granted, I've seen people make the same comparison that they are the cockroach of professional wrestling. They will just not fucking die. And again, I do not want to see them go out of business. I do not want to see anyone out of a job. And anyone rooting for TNA to go to business is an idiot. It's less wrestling. Even though, even though you know, despite how much you dislike it or you hate the product or you're sick of it, whatever, it's another place for people to work. Like it or not, it's the second biggest wrestling company in the United States. 
you know, Ring of Honor comes close, but they're not really on standard TV. I guess technically isn't, you know, TNA isn't either, but they're on Pop TV, a better deal than whatever Ring of Honor is on right now. So, I mean, again, they should live on. I want to see them continue on, but I'd rather just see them start from the ground up. I'd rather see TNA close and then WWE take the library so we could see that stuff on the WWE Network and then have Billy Corgan build up a new wrestling promotion from the ground up called completely something else, something else but TNA. That Those three initials are just a complete stench. They got that TNA stench. The TNA stench is, is alive and well in TNA currently. Even Impact Wrestling, I'd get rid of that too and just call the company something completely different just because people will not take them seriously until they get rid of the fucking TNA shit. It's so, so bad. That's that's terrible. So that's it, guys. That is it for hashtag AskGSM as always. Yeah, ta folks. Uh, so per usual, if you want to send in a question, be sure to tweet me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on the... Facebook page, give the page a thumbs up at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I put up on Sunday nights or on the wall itself. Or you can leave your comment on the comment section down below, right down below. And I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. So with all that being said, guys, per usual, thank you so much for sending your questions. Have an amazing week. We got no mercy on Sunday, so be sure to send in all your no mercy questions. Uh, your post most obviously your post no mercy questions. I record this show on Monday mornings. Seems like that's going to be the regular regular schedule going forward. Uh, so if you want to get your question on the show, be sure to send it in on Sunday night, early, early, early Monday morning. I, I I'm doing this right now around like nine, ten o'clock, and on Mondays. So earlier the better. Get your question in at the end of the week, Sunday nights, whatever that would work the best for me. So that being said, guys, be well, stay safe, have an amazing week. Uh, just enjoy wrestling. Have a great time watching No Mercy on Sunday. Enjoy your Raw tonight, or at least try, or at least hold that hope until SmackDown tomorrow. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, guys, and I'll catch you folks down the road.